Hello, everybody. John Sfiocla here with my dear friend, Ross Mayfield. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the future of hybrid work, and it's a delight to be here. And I'll introduce Ross in a second. But this is part of our ongoing series on growth innovators. That is, how do you use the digital and cloud and innovative technologies available to grow your business in a better way, uh, more profitably, and with more engagement of customers and clients? And so I, uh, it's, it's delightful to be here. Ross, welcome. Hi, John. Great to be here. And, and let me give you uh, folks an idea of what we're going to cover here, and then I'm going to introduce Ross. Um, so we're going to cover this notion of the integration of um, digital and physical, something that uh, really has been going on for a long time. Um, uh, some people would put it back to 1968 and the mother of all demos by Doug Engelbart, which we'll talk about more to the end. But we're, we're really lucky to have Ross here. So Ross uh, not only um, has built a number of incredible technologies like social text and others, but Ross is a person who um, I think more than anyone I've ever known has a combination of understanding of the social implications of technology, the technology itself, and then really is an entrepreneur and innovator who ships code. And uh, he's sitting at the uh, intersection of what I think is the most impressive area and the, the most impressive part about Zoom to me is the notion that they are winning in a market where they are uh, actually competing against free. And that free is brought to you by Google and Microsoft uh, and others, but certainly those two, and just gorillas in the space. And the most recent New York Times uh, review of web webinar technologies put Zoom at the top and recommends that rather than taking the free product, if you're a business from Google or Microsoft, what you ought to do is you ought to pay 150 bucks a year and use Zoom. If that's not a testimony to the excellence of the folks at Zoom and the work that Ross is doing, I don't, I don't know what is. When you can, when you can beat free by giants uh, is, is pretty impressive. So Ross, welcome. Pleasure. Um, great, John. Let's go ahead and get into it. I think uh, you had a deck, right? Yes. Uh, let me just uh, share a couple things about our sponsor, Manifold, here. Uh, in in terms of sharing, um, so at Manifold, what we're about really is this growth. We've got three parts of our business: advisory, ventures, and studios, where we build technologies, and then. Uh, we work with uh, small companies in terms of getting them started and helping them grow and large companies in terms of transforming to the digital age and really see a symbiosis between those two things. And underneath, uh, there's, a, there's a theme here that we think is happening to the entire world, which is that more and more of the world is becoming computable, which is the idea that we have more and more knowledge of what is happening in the real world and science is increasing and modeling is increasing and mental models are getting better. And then there's digitization of that job to be done. When you have those two things together, like what we're doing here in terms of this meeting, we can then compute that interaction. And those who are computing reality and using it for business advantage will generally crush those that are not, that don't have either the level of knowledge or the digitization because their economics is going to be inferior. So that's a thing that we explore again and again. And we are here now in the notion of hybrid work. So. Let me start there. Ross, the first thing I wanted to get into is what are some of the really important trends that you see? Because as much as anybody on the planet, you really have an informed view as to usage, innovation, what's coming down the pipe, both in the product set and in the ecosystem behind. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest trend is, um, you know, the huge amount of change that the world is going through or because of the pandemic, right? Um, during the pandemic, Zoom kind of rose to the occasion and grew from, you know, 10 million uh, daily meeting participants to 300. And all of a sudden it was supporting the education system, the healthcare system, kind of keeping families together. Now we're in the midst of this transition to, for lack of the better word, a hybrid, right? And that's a huge change. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, the office is never going to be the same, right? Um, mm -hmm. Some estimate, you know, you're only you're going to have 30 percent of the office not used anymore. Right. There's yeah. going to be kind of a um, because, you know, a lot of the 
a lot of what people, well, let's put it this way. Everything that we hoped might happen in the collaboration software industry in let's say a time span of 10 years or something like that suddenly happened in about 10 months. Uh, you had mass adoption of tools. Um, the center of those tools shifted from what was group messaging like Slack, for example, um, to more video at the center, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for a little while, everybody was working virtually um, where the interface for getting things done you know, effectively became Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're in this interesting transition where the, um, when it comes to hybrid, you'll have people in physical space, but they'll mm -hmm. always have with them the, that being augmented by a virtual space, yes. right? Um, to tell a little story about this. So a long time ago, like in 2002, I founded a company um, uh, that was doing collaboration software, social text. Um, and we started it as a distributed company from day one, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody was in the same right. place. We didn't have an office, et cetera. And this was back in the day where, you know, the very beginning, you know, we had, um, you know, we were using conference calls, freeconference.com. Uh, along the way, Skype came along. That changed it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the tools weren't quite there yet. We found a way to make it work, right? Mm -hmm. um, the interesting part of it was back then, you know, if later at a certain point, we ended up having an office and, um, and the dynamic that you always had was you'd have a group of people in the room with real high bandwidth between each other's picking up on all the different, all the different cues, sure. interpersonal communication. And there'd be one or two people that would be remote. Right. And this is kind of still before the pandemic was the norm. So you'd end up, unfortunately, the people who, if you're to really keep them in, um, involved in the conversation, the person facilitating the meeting really needed to play an active role to kind of bring that remote person or two into the room, right? Now, I think it's actually going to be the opposite. You'll end up having it where the majority of people that you're meeting with are in that virtual space, right? Yes. And one of the things that we have as kind of a goal is um, how do we make meetings more effective than they would be in person? And I do sure. believe that's possible. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of also in the return to hybrid work, what's interesting, like most people know Zoom for uh, Zoom meetings, right? Um, but also a big part of it is we, ha we have other products, right? There's Zoom phone, which is seeing tremendous growth, uh, kind of a PBX in the cloud. Um, We've made an acquisition of a contact center business. Um, the, uh, there's Zoom chat, which is again, group messaging, but also Zoom rooms mm -hmm. and Zoom room devices in the way that they handle um, taking intelligent video of the people in the room, dicing it into little rectangles. Mm -hmm. So you end up with this kind of uniform view um, yes. within the Zoom meeting of the physical uh, participants and the virtual participants mm -hmm. being on a level playing field. Yes. I think that's something that's really important, right? Um, so, so say more like, about that when you say being on a level playing field, and, and this goes back to this notion of computability, right? Once you can compute both of those, you can make them equivalent or make the experience seamless. Um, say more about what you mean on equal level. Do you mean in terms of texture and, and, and nuance and things like that? Or uh, what yep. do you mean? Well, the good thing is kind of at the core of Zoom, you have performant video, right? Unlike anybody else. That's the quality difference that makes it worthwhile paying versus, you know, free products that aren't as good, right? And we'll maintain that leadership and keep innovating in a video first way um, across the product line, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to the equal playing field, this is the thing where um, too much of the way that meetings work, right? end up being kind of dominated by the personalities, right? Um, there's a, you know, really a, a kind of a funny uh, old paper by a Stanford professor, and I'm hoping I don't completely blank on his name, right? Which is meetings as status contests, right? Okay, where, sure. Yeah, where essentially what you end up having is, you know, people at the top of kind of the, pe of the pecking order want to just kind of maintain the order, right? Yes. People at the bottom are trying to find ways of um, bringing themselves up in the yes. status contest. Yes. And people in the middle are trying to slap them down all the time, right? Mm -hmm. 
um, a lot of meeting dynamics end up being a matter of how you end up facilitating the meeting, right? Sure. Um, do you have the right people in the meeting? Does the meeting need to exist in the first place, right? right? What is the goal or decision that needs to be made? How is that structured in the agenda? How do you handle this in meeting workflow? So what occurs before a meeting, during a meeting, and after a meeting, sure. How are um, how is the record of that meeting captured, which can be automated these days? Yeah. Um, and how are those results shared, not just to the people who couldn't be in the meeting, but fulfilling what other workflows are in place, right? So, for example, I could be using a project management tool like Asana or Rike, sure, and using their Zoom app, the thing we'll talk about, I'm sure, um, to kick off meeting workflow make yep. decisions, prioritize, um, and knock off action items mm -hmm. um, in the meeting, but then continue in the project management workflow, right? Sure. So a lot of it is about how you're helping you know, meetings be more efficient, more effective, Sure. basic encoded practices, right? Yes. But then also making, as I mentioned, since now we're going to be meeting differently for the foreseeable future, right. where you'll always have virtual participants, how do you make sure that their engagement is equal, right? And uh, a lot of that is, uh, well, luckily technology can do some amazing things, like I was mentioning with the Zoom room devices. Yes. Um, but I think it'll be interesting just in general how that evolves. Yeah. No, it's fascinating. I mean, there's a, as you know better than I, there's a lot of research that has happened over the decades about um, computer mediated meetings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, University of Arizona was really big early in that. They had all these defense grants and so forth. And they found one of the big findings there was uh, pretty commonsensical, which is the quality of the meeting had a lot to do with two things, preparation and the quality of the facilitator, mm -hmm. right? And then, and then as you say, there's a lot of research on making meetings more productive and it has to do with, you know, what do you want to get out of it? What do you do doing it? What do you follow up on and so forth? Um, what do you think about one of the things that that is interesting to me is that there's also a set of research often done by sociologists or people interested in power and, and or network organization that say things like, OK, your career, even your life in your neighborhood is determined by the five block area near where you live uh, or in business settings. I believe it's true. I can't remember if it's 100 or 300, but it's basically the 300 horizontal feet in your office mm -hmm. has a lot to do with your career progression, you know, in terms of who you know and your status and so forth. So my question to you is, what does proximity mean? And, and we know that's so vitally important in the, in the old world, pre-hybrid. What does proximity mean in this new world? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So um, the, you know, uh, one of my co-founders, Pete Kaminsky of a prior startup, right? I uh, had a saying the time spent face to face was too valuable for work, right? And <laughs> I love it. Awesome. So we, we embodied this quite a bit in doing this kind of. So I've worked on in distributed teams for you know eighteen of the last twenty years, right? Sure. And one of the things that we do would be to have our offsite meetings where we'd actually fly people on site, right? Um, the office became a gathering place that was more for a social event, right? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and when we bring people together, we paid, we really made sure that what our goal was, was not necessarily like this highly structured, you know, strategy planning meeting, right? Yes. Um, but actually a place where we were making sure we were getting the right social interaction, right? Yes. The difference of being able to collaborate effectively with someone that you've met before in person, yes. yeah. uh, compared to not is considerable, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, one of the things that I did a long, long time ago was hosted the first bar camp. Um, a bar camp is an unconference format event. Um, a long time ago, this guy uh, who created open space methodology was a conference organizer. And mm -hmm. he was sitting by the fire, fireplace, kind of reading all the feedback forms, trying to figure out like, why were his events successful? Why were they valuable to yeah. the people who attended? And whatever, uniformly, people said it wasn't like how they had, they had the perfect speakers and the perfect agenda right. or anything. It was the hallway conversations that mm -hmm. they had at these events. So what he ended up creating was this really simple event format where um, uh, there was only a couple simple rules, right? 
whenever it, whoever is there is the right people to be there. Whenever it starts, it starts. Whenever it ends, it ends. Mm -hmm. And anybody can make and can provide a session, you know, give a talk. Um, and it was up to you as a participant um, to use the law of two feet. Mm -hmm. So if at any moment you weren't getting what you were hoping for out of a session to be able to go and find another one. And mm -hmm. what, we, what you can do with this event format is um, plan like a one or two day event, literally in 30 minutes, Yes. By putting up a grid of you know time and space um, of different rooms, right, in yes. different slots, and anybody at the beginning stands up and says, "I want to talk about like hybrid work," right, and puts it yes. up on the board. Um, so we use this same methodology for uh, doing our on-site retreats, right? Hmm. Um, and uh -huh. as a result, what we ended up finding was um, all of the things that we'd hoped to get through in a structured agenda got accomplished, got discussed more things were surfaced that were new and it was a more innovative experience that was more inclusive uh and in, more engaging from people right yeah so I, I still look at that as a really good example of the kind of thing that you'll have to do when working with a more distributed team than you were before the pandemic right yeah yeah no it's fascinating i remember many years ago when i was teaching at harvard business school we had bob johansson come in and present to the faculty and I was on the management information system faculty and Bob took the old um, Tuckman uh, group formation model, you know, norming, um, norming, forming, storming and performing. Right. And he said just what you said. And he said, look, when you're doing the norming and storming, you probably want to be physically together, at least some of the time, the performing part, you can be remote. Yeah. And it was interesting. And then after I left Harvard Business School, uh, I went to work at a place called Diamond. And at Diamond, we were, like you, virtual from the beginning. We had a very small office. We took the 10 percentage points of cost usually associated with physical plant equipment. We reinvested that in technology and training. Mm -hmm. okay. So our people were more trained and had better technology. But one of the things we did is we had three times a year, we had all hands meetings. Mm -hmm. And they were two days long. Mm -hmm. And they had, uh, you know, tons of interaction. They had you know, basically a bunch of a bunch of corporate report stuff, mm -hmm. then a bunch of training. Then we had this thing. It sounds similar to what you're saying. We called it the bizarre bizarre, where people could come and people really get into. They showed the work, you know, and and it was fun, and they did crazy stuff, and and really get into it. And it was all just, you know, like yeah. user led. And then of course, you know, we let the people who had charge cards have a, you know, a liberal expense mm -hmm. budget. Right. So, you know, 50 people going to a bar and going nuts. Right. Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and that was the glue. Right. That that made the virtual stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So uh, it, you remind me of something that John Perry Barlow, God rest his soul, the guy, you know, guy who started Electronic Frontier Foundation with Kapoor, mm -hmm. said to me one time, he said, uh, he said, John, you know what? You know, the Internet is the best thing that ever happened to jet fuel sales. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and his, his whole thing was, you know, yeah, virtual, but that's going to drive more. As yeah. you said so eloquently, as your partner said, yeah. you know, face to face meetings are way too important to, to leave the business. Yeah. And, and I will say we should speak to a lot of the social interaction is now happening, you know, online, of course, too. Right. Sure. And um, so one of the like uh, we just had Zoomtopia, our annual conference, and we have a product called Zoom events that we were running it on. Yes. And one of the parts of that uh, is a, you know, there was a um, virtual uh, conference hall, right? So kind of a top down blueprint view yes. of different social spaces. You could see where people were when you went to the space. You can engage by chat or you could even join into a small meeting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those kinds of um, virtual spaces we're seeing also in uh, other kinds of Zoom apps that are being built on the platform. The other thing with Zoom apps is um, because Zoom is not just for work like it was two years ago, um, we're actually, you know, there was a, a strange kind of consumer behavior that had to happen during the pandemic when we couldn't be in person, right? right. So suddenly you had people trying to play, you know, board games and things like that on Zoom, right? Um, now we have this whole category of games uh, within Zoom apps. Yeah. Where you can play things like charades and uh, board games, casual games. Uh, some of them are built specifically for team building exercises, like Funtivity, as an example. Um, 
some of them are, well, there's going to be a lot more in the way of innovation around that space, right? Sure. Um, and what's, it, what's been great is, I'll tell you, um, just for the team building exercises that we've had to do within our team, being able to open up and have a game as the way to facilitate the social interaction while still virtual has been a big difference, right? Fascinating. So really baking in the non-work work stuff together to, yeah. to, to get at the, sounds like to get at the emotional substrate of what you might pick up in a physical meeting. Yeah. 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 You know, that's interesting. So, uh, you know, what are the, what are the things that you think are going to happen over what kind of time period? You know, I was going to say three to five years, but that may be the wrong time period. Maybe it's 12 months from now and so forth. What are the, yeah. what are the things that, that, you know, you think that people are not aware of Mm -hmm. that are going to become a big deal in, in, and give us a time frame. I think um, the next two years are all about one of the biggest shifts um, where people are going to have, where companies are going to have to reinvest to try to figure out the way to work virtually, right? Uh, to work in hybrid or distributed fashion, right? Mm -hmm. um, part of that is going to be possible because some, you're not going to be spending as much on office leases anymore. Sure. Um, but really it is, you're trying to create an entirely different structure for work, right? Right. It does, like I think you mentioned, you, you do have to, or actually I'll put it a different way. Um, for managing in a distributed team, what yeah. you'll find is if there's one bit of advice I'd have is uh, try to find a way to over invest in communication. And I'm not just saying, you know, host more meetings, right? It's actually... Right. It's a combination of synchronous collaboration and asynchronous. Um, when the, high, when the pan pandemic hit, everybody shifted suddenly to trying to use Zoom. Wow. And uh, that was great for kind of saving the connective tissue of the org and keeping things running. Yes. But when you look at the companies that have been distributed over the years, right? So like Automatic as an example, or GitLab, all of these, by the way, have published amazing guides publicly about how they manage within their cultures, right? Mm -hmm. what you see is increasingly um, distributed work requires a little bit more of a written culture than what you had in the office, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're very basic processes and practices where you're in the process of getting things done, you're documenting as you go, right? And um, this is incredibly important also as more and more people are working across time zones, right? Where mm -hmm. typically you'll have a handoff, you know, at the end of the day or beginning of someone else's day, right? Right. Um, but so the more that you kind of put into the discipline of uh, asynchronous written communication, um, increasingly, you know, recorded messages, um, I, I, that's really important. I also think, you know, I also think we already spoke to how you have to overinvest again yeah. in your people to try to do a couple other things, right? One is, you know, how do you solve this connective tissue thing? How do you fly people in for on sites? How do you create virtual events, right? Yes. Um, the uh, the other thing that I think is really interesting is you actually have to. One of the more humane things about the pandemic is it brought everybody into everyone else's living room. Like, you know, John, I know has a dog because it was one in the background a little bit ago, yep. right? Um, and we're used to kind of, oh, there's real life happening, right? Um, yes. When you're managing people, I don't think I have to tell anybody this because they've experienced it. You actually have to be more in touch with the well-being of your employees, right? Um, when they're working in a distributed fashion. Right. Yes. Um, and there's a different kind of responsibility, I think, that organizations are taking on mm -hmm. for the well-being uh, of their people. Right. Yes. Um, for longer term. Right. Uh, I think I'd always turn to watch for more social innovation that are, will occur in consumer products mm -hmm. that are adapted into the enterprise. This has been an interesting time when you look at companies like Zoom or Slack or others where you actually had a little bit more enterprise first innovation. Yes. Um, of course, it was all borrowing off of patterns that existed, you know, before a little bit in consumer or open source, a little bit, things like that. Right. Um, but I would look to, you know, what is the next, you know, video clubhouse app that somebody creates on the zoom platform as an example, right. as a way of creating an engaging consumer experience. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, startups that are, um, 
trying to create new ways of leveraging breakout rooms within Zoom, right? As a way to do kind of one-on-ones in a facilitated fashion um, yeah. while you have everybody in a group session. Um, the, I think, you know, beyond that, it, well, I, I think that's as far as I'd venture, right? Yeah. Yeah, but it's amazing. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of demand and interest in, um, uh, you know, very focused applications that focused ideas like de- redesigning the business to business sales process, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's complex. It's, you know, in many constituencies, you're trying to move everybody on to, you know, to cohere around a particular decision. There's time pressure, but it's complicated, right? And, you know, and using the right modalities and, you know, people are throwing, you know, Google Docs at it and Zoom and this and that and the other thing, and like, how do you make all that come together? Uh, and you know it's traditionally a, you know a very big industry there uh, with folks like uh, uh, you know uh, the guy, the strategic selling uh, folks um, uh, Miller Hyman and things like that right uh, but that's all getting reinvented right yeah. around what that looks like and it's and it's really center of the plate for a lot of those business to business firms for people to figure out that they could sell without having to travel is really uh-huh. amazing yeah. right but. The thing that I'm seeing is uh, we're starting to fuse the system of engagement and the system of record, right? Um, yes. so like at Zoomtopia, we demoed the app by HubSpot, right? And Salesforce is working on one. And sure. Um, the uh, and we have a number of you know more specialized startups focused on kind of the sales horizontal, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Helping people do things like um, help the rep as they're selling be better informed. Um, structure the meeting given the stage in the buying process, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, with, there's a very big difference from, you know, a first time qualifying meeting to a pitch meeting to, you know, a signing ceremony at the end, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the difference is you're going to see reps being able to be informed, not having to be distracted in a meeting. Yeah. Um, the automating transcription, uh, highlighting uh, and, you know, focusing, helping the rep focus on uh, the right, let's say qualifying question in a meeting. Sure. Um, Being able to recognize when something is said and being able to provide information in context. Yeah. Um, And then again, it's kind of all going back to Doug Engelbart. It's all about augmentation, right? Yeah. Um, So you, the ability, I think kind of the, the interesting thing is there's kind of three steps in it, right? How do I augment the person trying to do their job with the right information at the right time? Yes. Make the best decisions to help guide the right part of the process, right? Mm-hmm. A second is um, somewhat with automation, yes. um, the ability for you to be able to take notes without doing the work, right? Um, yeah. And uh and the last part actually is where what I, where I'm not seeing enough yet. How do I change the process of selling to be more collaborative, right? Mm-hmm. With the customer and the vendor, right? Together, right? right. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example, like in the customer success management area, right? If I have a vendor and I'm trying to maintain their, their adoption, grow that account, make sure yeah. that they're happy, right? Yeah. In the end, starting at the moment of onboarding, there's kind of a checklist of things that the vendor does and things that the customer does towards a shared goal, right? It's um, creating experiences that take people in a collaborative way to go through that checklist in a process, right? Is I think a a big part of the way that the interaction is gonna get facilitated. Mm -hmm. That's that's really interesting. You know, in that domain, we're talking about as we're getting ready for this, the, you know, all the information, social information, cognitive information is available about any of us that's online. And um, so you see, you know, uh, your competitor WebEx trying to add stuff, you know, um, in terms of LinkedIn integration and so forth, bring the social and the individual context so I can see your background and, and you know, and of course, um, you know, you know, of technologies that we can do voice stress analysis and we can try to figure out if you're telling me the truth. And I mean, all these things in real time, right? Where do you see that combination of the cognitive, behavioral and the social context going in the near term? Um, you know, uh, I think there's some things that are obvious like integration of LinkedIn kind of information. Yeah. Uh, but how's that all going to go over the next few years? Well, 
it's already here. So um, one of the Zoom apps called Warmly, which uh, the Zoom apps, uh, we have a Zoom apps fund. It's a $100 million venture fund that invests yes. in seed and Series A startups. It's one of the investments that the fund did. Um, it lets you bring, it brings together information about the people that you're meeting from sources like LinkedIn, Twitter, and others, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got rich profiles in the participant list. It yes. lets you set a custom virtual background that acts as kind of a business card, right? So instead of it just like a logo and you know a name, it's got a little bit of information about who the person is, not just their right. job title, but you know where they located, anything else that they want to express, right? Sure. Um, and so I, I think that's just an example of like one of many, there's over 50 Zoom apps, right? That are already kind of delivering on that promise today, right? Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Um, to, to switch gears a little bit, um, what do you think are going to be the big losers here? I remember doing some consulting work for um, one of the major newspapers uh, back in 1998. Mm -hmm. And I remember leaving that meeting with my colleagues and, and we looked at each other and basically said, you know, we think that there are a bunch of people in there, you know, knitting sweaters for dinosaurs, right? I mean, there's, they're not, they just don't get what's going to happen to their business. Yeah. And, you know, shame on us. We should have been better consultants again to transform. But who, who's, who's knitting sweaters for dinosaurs right now? Yeah. I, I could point at industries like, you know, business class travel or something like that, or, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I think it's hard still to tell, right? Yeah. Um, the, uh, I do think that um, spending on office, will, I, it's hard to say whether it's truly going to be less or whether it's going to be just different, right? Yeah. So I, I do, like as an example, again, from this company that I had before, um, we actually expanded into an adjacent space mm -hmm. and in, we kept that open as a flexible workspace that anybody could go in and use and even experimented for a little while opening it up as a co-working space, right? Yeah. But uh, it also became this space that we would use for events, right? Mm -hmm. And those events might be employee ones, but also ones that were kind of open to you know, community events, which were, yes. you know, a tactic for marketing effectively, yes. right? Um, so I think what'll be interesting, the good thing is I think we're done with the kind of, um, uh, the open office, you know, experiment, right? Where we wanted to create um, you know, kind of the social connectivity by not even having cubicle walls, right? Yes. Um, I think there's just going to be a very different layout of space and use of space. And it's hard to tell whether that means uh, less revenue or because there's change, right? Um, more of a shift. It's actually ironic as heck that WeWork is really well suited for this world as opposed mm -hmm. to the pump and dump that they did before. Um, yes. You know, uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how um, we have already seen this big shift kind of from cities to suburbs again, right? Yes. Um, so in, I don't know, in the end, there's a lot of change and with that, with that a lot of opportunity, right? Yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, so a friend of mine, Joel Lippmann, has got a company, Valance, and they, uh, they do you know, investment research. And uh, for the past close to a decade now, they've been talking about this whole trend toward what they call your homes, your castle. And so everything from security systems to, to you know, large screen TVs to configurable, uh, you know, um, gym equipment and things like that just happening in the home. And, and they, they think, yes, the, they called it before COVID, COVID accelerated it, but they think it's a long term trend yeah. to uh, that, that kind of, you know, your homes, your castle, wherever that is, right? Um, so it's, it's interesting. And, and you're saying, look, this is how it gets integrated in. Um, you know, Ros, what are some of the um, concerns you have in terms of, you know, you're a leader, um, you know, and, and you talk to, you know, traditional companies that, as you say, kind of put a finger in the dike with, with um, you know, Zoom technology during the pandemic and so forth. Uh, but I get the feeling when I talk to a lot of um, senior executives, it's like, they think of the COVID thing and hybrid work as kind of I mean, they make make noises that's here to stay, but really they're, and you see some of this in terms of, you know, folks like um, Morgan Stanley saying everybody has to come back to work physically, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, kind of how do you look at all that and, and how do you think about it and how do you advise them? I would say, you know, 
the senior leaders are going to trend towards the way that worked for them, right? Yeah. Um, by nature, right? Right. But I think there's a difference in the way that work should work for employees, right? Yeah. I think that you're going to see if you're not running a distribute your company as a distributed team in the next little bit, you're going to have trouble competing for talent. Not everybody, but a certain large group yeah. is going to be driving towards trying to get remote work uh, as an opportunity, or at least hybrid, where they go into the office, you know, once or twice a week or something like that, right? Right. Yep. Uh, and that will require some people to change, as we've talked about a lot, but also in their management practices, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing I, I think is kind of interesting is. Um, Distributed, when I was running distributed teams as startups, I wouldn't hire entry level employees, right? They would need to have some kind of maturity and work experience elsewhere before putting them on a, on a distributed team to succeed, right? Yeah. That doesn't fit a lot of companies' models, right? Where, like, you know, Google created campuses that were literally campus like atmospheres. Right. So people could transition seamlessly from, you know, Stanford onto, their Mountain View campus, right. and it would include kind of the social life, right? right. Um, I think it's actually the one small exception about this, like we have kids in college that have spent almost all of their college time in working, learning remotely, right? Yeah. Um, I think that small blip in the generation, right, um, is going to be, it'll be interesting to see as they enter into the workforce, right? Yes. Um, whether they kind of learned a different kind of maturity yes. uh, for not just using the tools, but, you know, if you're staying on track and staying effective and picking up and learning, um, which includes finding ways creatively to get some of that through osmosis, right? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, in it, but in any event, I do think there's definitely differences generationally yeah um i there's a lot that's changing also in just education in general right sure. um increasingly more remotely increasingly kind of the hybrid shift to me is stuff that is a lecture you could consume as a video right that you would watch sure. asynchronously the group work is the stuff that you really need to um that needs to be in real time right um and that was a trend trend line, you know, before that before the pandemic, right? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I'll tell you one of the things I, I worry about is the um, uh, is the the difference between the the the, the self motivated and the digital haves and the have nots, and and also as you say the the kind of entry level experience. You yeah. know what I mean? And, um, and 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 there's there's data out there that's you know says some of the learning during this time, you know, for K through 12 was, was really bad on average. Yeah, yeah. And then my, uh, I have five adult children and my second oldest boy teaches in the Chicago public schools and he teaches music and, um, and math. And, um, you know, he just said, uh, you know, the, the amount of learning, uh, because there's others in, in the, in those in inner city public school, there's a whole bunch more going on yeah. You know, in Chicago, you know, safe space, socialization, yeah. a bunch of other things that really, um, you know, uh, have, uh, this technology hasn't been engineered anything like the school to at least deliver some of those things, yeah. you know, good or bad. Um, so I, I do really worry about, yeah. worry about that, um, you know, because I, I just haven't seen anything that, I don't know if you're seeing anything in the marketplace that like really deals with some of those issues. I think the hard part is the digital divide got amplified very quickly in the pandemic, right? Yeah, when you have right. kids trying to do their homework in a car in the parking lot of the high school, because that's where they can get Wi-Fi and other other things like that, right? Um, and I, un unfortunately, at least in the United States, we don't really invest very well into the public infrastructure that people need digitally. Yeah. Um, and hopefully those issues have been surfaced more substantially, right? Um, but but also i think there's even a, a a point it kind of brings to mind the role for hr in a large organization um to matriculate people through a learning process that is both structured and social while having tracking and driving performance 
there's something about that that feels very different these days, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And to your point, I know that uh, there have been efforts over the years, you know, you probably know Bob Frankston, you know, he yeah. he's worked a lot, you know, he's the guy with, with um, you know, Dan Bricklin who invented spreadsheet for those who don't know him. And Bob's worked for many years to try to get municipal Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think he would tell you has had a heck of a time uh, doing exactly. it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I worked with Dan too. We created a social, uh, we created a wiki spreadsheet. Um, Yes, that's yeah. how I met you. It was Social through Calc a long time ago. Yeah, I exactly. remember. But yeah. I loved WikiCalc. It was great. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, anyway, that's part of another whole conversation about yeah, yeah. the you know you know this concept of a boundary object that sits at the nexus of social worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Susan Starr. The uh, anyway, we Dan and you talked a little about that. Anyway, another conversation. Um, you know, just in terms of um, you know how to if if you know you're working in a large organization, you're trying to to do this, or you're doing a startup, what are the things you need to pay attention to and read and so forth to really utilize hybrid work beyond simply, you know, open up the Zoom map, flipping through? How can I be more, more thoughtful about this? Because if, if we draw an, I, I believe we can draw an analogy back to the Industrial Revolution where, you know, um, where, you know, ta uh, Fred Taylor gets together with, with uh, Ford and others, but especially Ford. And really re-engineered management. And, and, and I'm a true believer that the only sustainable advantage in the long term is a superior management process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you can point to folks like some of the things that Bezos has done and so forth as a superior management process, you know, regardless of what you think about his business, which you know is phenomenal. I mean, he he has done some things that were breakthrough. Um, from the tactics of you know writing the memos all the way through uh, the the values of every day is day one, um, you know how who who are those people or how do we think about that? I mean, how do you who's the Fred Taylor of today? <laughs> the Taylorism. Um, the uh, well, I I'd kind of put it. You know, one of the different one of the difficulties when you're working in a hybrid or a distributed fashion, right? Yeah. Is um, I actually think it puts more of an emphasis on culture, right? Hmm. Culture has an important capability to help guide decisions that people make when less people are watching, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I see this with Eric, our CEO, really leaning in right now to try to um, foster more of an enhancement of the Zoom culture, which already has great pillars, like the way that we're obsessed about customer happiness and employee happiness, right? The, um, but also like I worked at LinkedIn for a brief stint and one of the um, cultural values that they embodied was a principle of members first, right? Yes, yeah, and I remember that. And have these product meetings where every now and then someone would say, hey, you know, we've got this great marketing technology that we could, you know, deploy, right? That would take advantage of the data that's being shared on profiles and social interaction, right? But mm -hmm. that meeting, that idea did not go very far because that principle would speak for the values of the company and people, it was easy for people to remember and to turn to, right? To guide a decision when less people are watching, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's just really, you know, um, the value of that's increased quite a bit. The other part is that in culture, um, I, I really like uh, Ben Horowitz's writings recently. Mm -hmm. um, in particular about trying to embody culture in small um, uh, small tactics, right? He, in one of his books, he, uh, he spoke about a, a company where you had to show up five minutes early to a meeting. And if you weren't, uh, you were fined a certain dollar amount per minute or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, which kind of embodied a way of making sure that people were prepared, people were present, people were engaged, right? Yes, right. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that one in particular, but there has to be little time, like you mentioned uh, Bezos's culture. The thing about having the uh, written culture where at the beginning of a meeting, you're sitting there and you're reading the brief together quietly about the meeting as a way of going into it. Yes. Um, it's a, a great tactic, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it, it uh, I think people waste a lot of time not being in the same cognitive space. Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the facts and so forth. Uh, 
you know, I had the, the great good fortune of, you know, doing some discussion teaching uh, before we would do cases. And the cool thing about a case was the expectation was everybody had the facts and the, and the players up and in their head. And it wasn't socially acceptable to not. You couldn't say to me, hey, John, I didn't read the case. You'd be like, you know, that would be that would be a bad day for you if I were teaching, you know. Um, and uh, but that expectation, just as you say, you know, sets a whole environment that you can have a discussion at a much higher level than simply sharing facts and 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 trying to you know find the proverbial elephant you know with the blind people um anyway um you know uh, very interesting um what do you think um Russ, this does to physical locations um you know steel case um did a pretty good job for a while um of i think inventing you know uh Lego like modular capability and you know for for knowledge workers. Um, clearly, uh, Steve Jobs spent a boatload of time wearing the problem. Uh, you know, if you go to the Pixar facility over in Oakland, uh, you know, he 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 completely reinvented um, an old style factory into being and and as I understand it, I, I never I never met Jobs, but as I understand it from the folks there, he spent an enormous amount of time thinking through the details. Yeah. of social interaction um you know everything from where the bathrooms were placed to you know who who you know what the halls were shaped like you know mm -hmm. the light certainly where you ate yeah. you know all that stuff yeah i think uh probably more of an emphasis on flexibility and creating spaces to be creative um you know a long 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 time ago um it was a guy who was running facilities for Sun Microsystems, and he gave me a tour of, you might remember when everything was about, uh, there was a lot of hype around telecommuting, they had a thing called the network computer, right? And what they did effectively to facilitate this was they had one building where, now all of this, by the way, using, including solutions like Zoom for hot desking, uh, Zoom room devices, right? Yeah. I, I think a lot of it is, you'll end up having it so, um, people will come to an office and not necessarily have the same place that they always sit because they're not going to be in that seat all the time and it would be underutilizing the space, right? Sure. But more uh, creative configurations of where people are proximate, given who shows up or needs to be there on that day, right? Um, a lot less of that problem of not being able to find, you know, an available conference room. Right. Sure. Um, right. Which in high growth, you know, tech companies is a huge issue. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, but again, I, th I think it, it speaks to, you know, people are going to be creative about the space, not just for their employees, mm -hmm. um, but also how it opens up to more of the world. And that could just start with the way the customers uh, come visit, participate. Right. Uh, it could evolve to be depending on the company ones where you know companies are opening up to effectively create community spaces like i was talking about before right yeah no it's it's interesting too when you said you know you started uh, your native hybrid right mm -hmm. and, and social text and some of your other firms that you started we were native hybrid at diamond mm -hmm. and um you know it, it is the the, the um, i wasn't one of the founders of the company i came in shortly after the founding but the, they really worried a lot about culture, the things you mentioned, social continuity, cognitive continuity, or, or they started with, God forbid, it was so long ago, they did Lotus Notes and pagers, okay, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, and then migrated over time. But the, the reason Lotus Notes was there was that they had this, the shared work product. So no matter where you were physically with a client, you, know, you, could, you had that shared information environment that was coordinated and controlled and secure. And... Um, and then there's a whole culture around, you know, when you're supposed to have your pager on and, you know, when you're supposed to call back and so forth. And, and they had actually worked all that out. And then we migrated as technologies migrated, but, um, but it was very, it was very conscious and the all hands meetings, right. Um, which cost us about, you know, anywhere from 300 to 600 grand a meeting, but it was well cheaper than the cost of the real estate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and more fun to, to be, you know, it's one of it's the really things that I'm seeing in the all hands meetings, uh, which became a really important thing over the last year or so. Yeah. Um, so there's Zoom apps like uh, Poly, Mentimeter, Survey Monkey. Yeah. That, uh, facilitate things like icebreaker questions, Q&A, polling sure. in a richer way. Um, yeah. 
including like in Mentimeter, you can have a, you run a quick survey, what should I talk about next while running a webinar, right? And we're expanding Zoom apps for running in webinars in this year, right? Um, but again, it's just, you know, more ways to engage uh, employees, um, which has become a really important thing, right? Um, the, particularly like within the Zoom culture, making sure that, um, there's an open channel for people to give feedback to the executive management uh, to ask questions, have those answered publicly, right? right. Um, it's an important part, at least of our culture, I think increasingly of more, more companies, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I think the, uh, you know, uh, there's another, another thread I'd like to ask you about, which is the, what's the design ethos? And, um, you know, back, um, when Jeff Rayport and I were talking about the early market space stuff, so we went from place to space, the thing that we compared it to a lot was television, right? And QVC and where cable TV was going because, and you saw that happen, right? You look at, um, you know, there's the layering of content, there's the active content and passive content, a bunch of stuff that conceptually was around, you know, since the 70s, but was starting to get implemented in the late 90s, right? And now you've got unbelievable richness in video you know, mm -hmm. TikTok to Netflix winning the Emmys to, I mean, video, I mean, it's, it's like, um, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's like the early days of film, but better. I mean, in every dimension, you know what I mean? I mean, you look at, you look at the early films, like the Charlie Chaplin did and so forth. I mean, they didn't even move the camera, right? It was just, it was just stage on film, yeah. but you know, you've got every dimension, um, of, you know, uh, uh, quality, length, uh, creativity, mm -hmm. and, and even merging with the gaming environment. So how do you think about the design ethos in this rich video world? Yeah. Um, so at Zoom, we're real, I can't speak to some of the stuff in the lab, but yeah. the, the interesting part I think is we have the opportunity to continually innovate in a video first manner, right? Um, and to re even rethink other kinds of collaboration products in a video first approach, right? And that's at the core of what Zoom is, right? Um, our core competency is around facilitating video communication, right? The interesting thing, so um, I'm running the Zoom Apps program, right? Uh, we've, we're have we also in the midst of making this kind of transformation to the killer app that everybody adopted during the pandemic. Yeah. It's a platform that people can build upon for work or for play, right? And What's interesting about that is um, there the approach, it's not so much that we're designing it, but we're creating the right conditions for things to emerge, for innovation to happen that wouldn't happen within the Zoom team, right? Mm -hmm. um, as a way of getting at what is the whole product concept for our customers, right? Um, part of that is we're, you know, it's like, you know, 20 years ago when I did a collaboration software company, right? that product didn't have to integrate with anything, right? Yeah, right. Um, people would use a couple things maybe side by side. Yeah. It's a very different environment. Like if you started a collaboration startup, the first kind of question is like, what's the core of what your product is? But right. then second, you know, how do you integrate with requisite stuff? Because mm -hmm. that's an expectation. And how do you make sure you're gaining distribution for your product, right? Yeah. Um, very different environment uh, for tool makers, right? Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Ross, I'd like to turn to, uh, we have a part of this thing uh, they call the rest of the story. I'd like to turn to that just briefly about Doug Engelbart. And the reason is, uh, we're going to get to it in a second, the mother of all demos, which we'll describe in a minute. But I remember, um, I think it was Peter Drucker who said, God rest his soul, um, many years ago, he said, usually the implications of a transformational technology happen roughly 50 years after. So if you go back in the history of the steam engine, you know, I think, um, you know, the, the controllable steam engine is 1820, 1870, life explodes around the steam engine, right? Um, so here we are 52 years after, um, you know, the mother of all demos. So let me just put that up briefly here, um, which is for those of you who, uh, I will say my knowledge of it and, and Ross probably knows more. This is a example uh, a picture uh, from the mother of all demos. So the guy on the on the right here is a guy by the name of Doug Engelbart. And for those of you, and, and on the left, this is um, uh, what this is an active screen, and Doug is doing uh, video communication between the Mac, um, 
the the conference center downtown San Francisco. I think it's Marconi Center mm -hmm. and and Palo Alto. He's doing it live. And if you watch this demo, which you can get on YouTube, uh, it is the response time is unbelievably fast. The thing on the left hand side is the bitmap graphics. It's hierarchical. It's interactive. You know, he can go in and it's it's kind of a, a hypertext you know, version of Word, if you will. And this whole thing is running on, I think, PDP eight machines. Anyway, it's going, you know, on teeny little machines, like less than, less than, you know, a hundredth of your iPhone. Um, and the response time is unbelievable. So this is 1968. And for those of you who don't know Doug Engelbart, um, Alan Kay, who um, is the inventor of object-oriented programming, among other things, and the Dyna book and so forth, first employee at Zurich Park, um, Alan says, look, um, he thinks that Doug Engelbart is to the personal computer revolution what Newton is to physics, okay? And, and if you know Alan, that's pretty tall cotton. I mean, you know, because Alan, Alan what's, what's the old saying? He throws around uh, nickels like manhole covers. I mean, Alan doesn't throw around compliments too often. Yeah. And for Alan to say, you know, that Engelbart, who recently passed away about a year and a half ago, I think, uh, but Russ, um, you know, back to this thing from Peter Drucker, you know, 50 years later, you know, you are whatever, uh, you know, the, the cotton farmer with the, with the cotton gin powered by steam here, you know, uh, uh, I, I know you have some uh, thoughts on our yeah. friend uh, Engelbart. It, it's well, um, so I had a, a, a couple good opportunities to interact with them a lot, right? And yeah. um, they, I will say, like everything we're doing in Silicon Valley is still trying to implement that vision that was set out 50 years ago, literally. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I had two great experiences. One was um, uh, to sit in his office and have him live stream. Um, I was the guy who showed up at, with Skype to okay. live stream so he could um, talk to an audience that watched the mother of all demos demo <laughs> uh, it was in Copenhagen, right? Yeah and uh, take questions from them, right? Um, right? But the other experience was I was at his house when he was hosting a party and out of nowhere, he goes to his closet and he pulls out the original mouse. Ah. And the way that this little wooden uh, for, device- For those of you who don't know, Engelbart invented the mouse, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then he goes into the story describing about how, where the invention came to him. And he said, I had a dream of flying above a space with a horizontal and a vertical axis, right? And having information in this space organized, right? Which is the X wow. and Y axis of, of the mouse, right? Wow. Um, Isn't that amazing? Uh, yeah. Wow. But, yeah. You know, what, a, what a treasure and a gift he, he was and is to us, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's uh, really worthwhile to look into Engelbart's work. The, the thing I remember the most about his vision was that he was trying to understand how to raise the collective intelligence of skilled people doing complex, urgent, interdependent work. And, uh, and the, yeah, the whole way he thought about the problem from the methods to the inventions that, that he fathered or inspired, it's just uh, to, to your point, Ross, is still, still, still inspirational today. Yeah. Well, I think that's a fantastic place to stop. Thank you. I know you are a very busy man always, but especially now. And congratulations on your successful launch of the apps thing and much more success to you. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I, again, I come back to, wow, if you can, if you can beat Microsoft and Google who are giving away your product and, you know, do something good enough to charge a price for it, God love you. I mean, that is, that is a high bar. And, uh, and I can't think of a better person to, to keep the team moving in the right direction. So thank you. Thanks, John. It's always great talking to you. Great talking with you. Um, let me just give you an idea of what's next. Um, so we continue on our Growth Innovators uh, series. Uh, by the way, any of this is available to you. We believe in Creative Commons, share and share alike. Um, so we, we want to forge that future together. Um, so we use the Creative Commons license for any of this and any material we share with you on this. And then uh, next month, we're going to have a dear friend of mine, Steve Salzinger. And Steve uh, is a, a super sophisticated guy in the area of technology and especially consumer products. And Steve is in the middle of launching a brand new uh, genetically uh, sophisticated uh, skincare brand. And he's going to talk about um, how you can launch things uh, 
radically faster and asset light in terms of launching a brand new consumer brand and what he is doing in his uh, new company, Rescue Products. So relevant to everyone. So I uh, hope you can join us there and look forward to seeing you next, uh, the last Friday in October between 12 and 1 East Coast time. Thank you.